like set the table and like put the glass of water out and then put the water over the water and then set out the whole water for the cat. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. It looks like everyone has served. Um, uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time or in a while, this is the Smart Mobility Connection Series. Um, this is the seminar series where researchers um, with Chapter 21 present their research either in progress or completed um, to get uh, sort of feedback and interest from you all and uh, uh, leave some time for questions and engagement again. Um, the series happens every two weeks, and um, for those of you who are interested in staying up to date, um, and also for those of you who are interested in uh, making sure we have the right amount of food, please check in on this at the URL uh, during the talk at any point that comes to you. Um, today, we're lucky enough to be joined by Professor Ping Zhang. Um, hey, this is at uh, the School of Z, and uh, we'll be talking about sensing and uh, wide distribution. And we're very excited to talk to you. Please welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, good morning. It's still morning for me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about sensing and thinking how we sense in the right. I want to be lazy and how can we be lazy and smart? So first of all, what are we doing in the city? So in the city, we want to know a lot of things. Um, <laughs> so you guys all find this for this one. So in the city, you want to know a lot of things, right? So first of all, you want to know where the traffic jams are, the managers want to know that, the driver want to know that. And in the city, you want to know where the air pollution is. So you can know how to prevent it, or how to avoid it, or breathe it. And there's other applications like how do you the noise, where are the noises, how do you detect fire with special events like those, or maybe like riots, uh, and also how do you know like places that you need. Okay. Now all these things require data. It requires getting data. Okay. And then there's one problem. Well, not one problem. We're dealing with a city. So this is a map of the city of Beijing. And the city share a lot of things with other cities. Namely, as you come to okay? So now we actually need to sense, if we're talking about city of Beijing, we need to sense 1,600 square miles. And for New York, we need to sense 300 square miles. That's 200. How do we do that? And if we learn things, we need to get data. All these machine learning stuff, you talk to machine learning people, they always tell you, tell the sensing people, this is good data. And I want that too. <coughs> so how do you get the good data throughout the entire city? And it's impossible to control sensors everywhere. I only have seven PhD students. <laughs> they, they can't go everywhere and report. And in a city with places as the Forbidden Palace is even harder, right? So how do you actually deploy? And we probably get a hint, namely we're in the the Traffic 21 Mobility Transportation blah blah blah. Not blah blah blah, we'll be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually using taxis. So why why use taxis? Well, in Beijing, we have 66,000 taxis. That's not a lot if you've ever been to Beijing. You'll never deal with it. <laughs> in New York, much smaller, we have 73,000 taxes. Wow. Right? So these are great if they let us to use them. <laughs> because they drive around for a long time. In, 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 uh, in Beijing, the, the taxi driver drives in the day. When they go to sleep, somebody else drives during the night. <coughs> so the taxis are always moving. And in New York, each medallion, they, they sell these medallions. You can get a medallion to drive a taxi, and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, for a case, but that's a story. But they, they are driving a lot of time because of how, how valuable these things are. And they drive everywhere, or they can drive everywhere. 
No, so it's a it's a potential really good source to create data. Okay. Um, so how do you uh, so so what so, so that's great. You know, our problem is solved. We just put some sensors <laughs> on there and everything's done, right? Uh, no, I have PhD students support, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, so if we look at some data things, yeah, we'll put a bunch of cars, collect a bunch of data. It's a simulated. On the right hand, on the left hand side, it's a simulated map. On the right hand side, we have the simulated. I'll show you real things. Yeah. And it's missing longitude, latitude, and the color represents all pollution. Right? So, so that's the data. And we, so, but then taxis do move. So what happens when the taxis are kind of in the upper left hand corner? We get another. <coughs> this is the other bracket. Yes. So. Which one's better? We really don't know. Well, actually, we do because it's simulated. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is an error. The top one blue is better. Uh, and the red is really bad. Thank you. I'll stop by. Um, so you see the error when the car is not there is really bad because our inference algorithm, no matter how good it gets, if it doesn't have real data, it's not good, right? So what's the problem? Well, because the car isn't there. And why isn't the car there? Well, probably because there's rider in the system, right? Surprise, surprise. Taxis aren't designed to support CMU researchers. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a few questions. So first, what is better? Right? How, can, how can we? First, need to define what is better data collection that leads to more accurate learning in the physical system. We have only so few nodes, so we need to collect better data, but first we need to understand what that better data is. Two, how can we get better? How can we actuate these taxis to go to places to get well, optimal, sorry. Oh, I think that works. Again, close the for foreign. And question number three, how to learn from the data with less data? I realized that makes machine learning go, and there's machine learning back over there. <laughs> but, but in the same thing, it's really hard to collect these data, so you have to do with less data. Now, because, um, because of the time I have, they told me to create a day on this. Told me to create a talk that's 30 minutes, so we can start. I'm going to ignore the last question, and that's just to tell you we actually use a physical, data, a physical model to generate some stuff. That leaves us two questions. And I'm also going to focus on the second question, but let's take a little peek at the first one. So, what is better data for us? Okay. So, first of all, we need some kind of coverage. If the car is not there, it cannot collect data. So the more places we can cover, the better it is. So if we separate the city in a grid, this four grid cover, let's call that 12.5% cover. Now if we spread out the car a little bit, it covers 25%. Yay, we're better. That's the definition. You keep with me. <laughs> Let me lose you yet. So less larger percentage of cover area is better than smaller percentage covering. Ideally, we have 100%, but uh, that's our measure. So the spatial distribution matters as well. Same 12 points of same four grid coverage. If I concentrate everything in the center, in the center business district where all the riders are. It's actually not as good as spreading these uh, coverage out. Why is that? Say if I want to inference this little corner area, I want to inference to figure out what that is. With data closer to it, I can do a better job. <coughs> so 
so more accurate and closer approximate. So the takeaway is even distribution is better than concentrated distribution. So the math will show you the equation later. <laughs> but basically, to take away larger percentage and even distribution, that's what we're going to get. So now, how do we actually get to the fun part? The, how do we actually, not the math, not fun, how do we actually the speed to get better data? Okay. So the goal is to get this good data with larger percentage and even distribution. So if we have a slightly offset distribution, we can do some actuation, one, two, actuation. And you pick a few parts, get the driver, and spread it. Okay? And see, I told you there's equation. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is an equation we're dealing with. Uh, very simple, trust me. Basically, it's using the data coverage, uh, how many grid is covered. Um, Add that with uh, with some fudge factor. Add that with the uh, distribution of the data, and that what we call is a sensing coverage fault. So, so the metric, of, so the, the variables we're playing with is the which axis do we want to activate, and the route that path can take. Subject to Okay, no <laughs> Subject to <laughs> 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 so which area that they're constrained to? Time constraint, what is the time limit that you can actually do something? Mobility constraint, or you can't fly, you can only drive on road, and where you can go where you cannot, right, but in a given time. And budget constraint, we want to pay the drivers, but we're researchers. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of the, so we went through the motivation and the problem formulation. I'm going to focus on the existing solutions, then we're going to talk about this, uh, our system, how we integrate the mobility, write requests, don't worry, it's only 30 minutes, I won't do that long, that's <laughs> very brief. And we're going to show you our real world evaluation, and hopefully give you a live demo that you can handle that. Uh, since the server is actually in China, not just our um, and conclusion. Okay, so let's go through the existing solutions. I'm going to be a little dismissive because it's not my work. Um, basically, right now, a lot of weight factory drivers is contracting. Get your Ubers, get your stuff, uh, this that you're familiar with, and um, even taxi they have. Right. Basically, for a taxi driver, I suppose to work with, uh, they have to say, you have to be able to follow our instructions five times a month. And I'll give you a certain amount of money for that. So basically, they get instructions, they go to the airport and get $100. Monetary costs, quite high. Uh, this is actually the contract. They're not going there voluntarily. Uh, participant motivation, well, it's kind of medium because don't really want to go with your contract, but you don't want to do that contract. So it's kind of a motivation. This one performance is really good though, because they actually have to go there, right? By contract. And then there's also like a large amount of work in the bidding kind of system where where they actually uh, do a lot of research about uh, here's some money, anyone with a bid, bid lower, bid lower. Right? So the money cost cost is very low. The motivation is not great because you actually had to play on your mobile phone while driving a lot. Um, and it's actually kind of unstable, right? Because it's a bidding system. Right? It's basically eBay on tax. So the challenge. First of all, we need to figure out what taxi want to act with. Okay. So we have limited budget, again. Uh, but we have taxi location. Believe it or not, believe it or not, uh, all the taxis that we work with uh, in Pittsburgh, in New York, and in Silicon Valley, Beijing, 
Um, they they all have GPS. And I used to give this presentation. I said Beijing has they all have GPS, and, and people were like, "Oh my God, I'm sure they're in government." <laughs> but um, so so basically, um, the idea is now we have four grids with cars in there. Too many cars. Let's take this grid for example. Which cars do we actuate? Well, let's say this green car is gonna next time slot is gonna drive to this other grid with lots of cars. But that's probably a good car to actuate. We want to actuate that into a place where we can actually have more utilization. Right? So we want to actuate that away from the area. But what about this red car? This red car was gonna drive to the rural place anyway. We really shouldn't give them money to actuate. Right? Then we're just wasting money. But we shouldn't activate this grid. So um, basically, if we activate, it's a waste of OK. Another thing is, which route are they going to take? Or which route are we going to let them? If there's some person having a tank, or there's likelihood, high likelihood of a person having a tank, if we tell the car to go there, the drivers, the, the taxi drivers aren't dumb, most of them. They will know where the uh, drive papers are likely to be, so they will be much more willing to. But if we activate them to anywhere else, we need higher fine. So basically, first one, we have to predict um, the possible routes, how the taxi, uh, how the taxi needs to go. Um, basically, guide the taxi selection for the economic budget. And two, we have to predict where our go past, okay, and lower the cost and increase the cost. Because again, taxi drivers aren't designed for design pickup. Okay. <coughs> so, fortunately, for our, the data we have, uh, we do have all the GPS information. The, for uh, two years for the taxi, so we can predict the uh, location. And for number two, not just the GPS, you no know, right, uh, right reliable. For the New York data, uh, Uber released the New York data, so we have all that. Um, okay, so we build a nice little system. So basically, you have your input, a uh, bunch of taxis with the trajectory and their availability. Again, we're not actuating any. Uh, any tax with the drive, uh, with the pass. Uh, um, do some pre processing and then actually update our vehicle mobility prediction model and the drive request prediction. And then we calculate the incentives based on the drive request. And then we put all of these information into the OT incentive activation algorithm. Okay. And then we keep on iterating. Let's first look at the incentive calculation. Um, basically, it's potential passengers plus money. Okay. And this is the equation. This is the better form. <laughs> so, so basically, what we're doing, we're guarantee a minimum, which is a gas cost. And we don't want them to go totally nothing. It's still due to be nice to have the um, The maximum, which is the entire tax Hopefully we don't pay that. But if there's actually no, nobody out there, we will have to. And somewhere in between, based on the expected rise of right? If we're sure 100%, there's like 50 people there and one tax there, then we don't pay that. OK. Uh, so the multi incentive actuation algorithm basically is this thing. It's, uh, well, we try solving with brute force. Pretty soon we figure out uh, not a good idea. Uh, why is that? Well, say we have ten taxis out of hundred, right? And we want to actually five hundred. <coughs> Basically, taxi selections uh, hundred choose ten. It's uh, basically one times ten to the thirteenth possible choices. And route selection is nine to the fifth. And pick up. 
and the student came back to me and said, oh, it's an empty complete problem, empty hard problem. Oh, I <laughs> so it's very large amount of combinations. Okay, very large combination. A utility function is non linear, and the actuation problem is much more complicated than real time. And we're not Google, so we're going to do something different. Um, instead, we're going to actually. Uh, calculate the expected taxing numbers that are passing through a grid. Right? And we're going to take the one with the highest number, start looking at that. So there's not that much taxing now. We've limited down by a lot. And now we're going to calculate the rank of contribution and, and rank the contribution to our utility fund. Namely, where are they going to go? Are they going to be helpful? Good. Are they not going to be helpful? Let's activate. So the taxi with minimal contribution, then we get the money. So the least useful you are the more money. <laughs> but that, that's basically it. Yeah, the least contribution you can do for our sampling system, we'll try to factor you so you can give us more. And then we iterate that <coughs> until it's eventually complete. Or until we give up. OK, so. Y'all looking at me like you don't believe this thing works. Uh, I didn't believe either. So we actually went out. We hired a bunch of taxi. That's why I should probably block out their name. I'm uh, sorry. I don't work out there. Um, so we, we asked them to drive around for us. Right? They have a little mobile phone. We give them a, an app. It's a GPS coordinate where we wanted to go. <laughs> and then most of so, so we do have someone else fighting in the car as well, telling them that GPS is this location. I already so we tell them where to go, and we actually collected uh, 230 actual traces. And we also, uh, for the rest non actuated traces, we have uh, real taxi history data, and we use those. Okay. And so that means. Out of this experiment, 50 kilometer by 15 kilometer, uh, the center of vaping, uh, we have about 91% uh, unaccurate. So we're accurate in less. Uh, the baseline we compare against no actuation, nothing, just go wherever you want. Some actuation randomly selected to randomly uh, find routes and ran uh, to the, the even better than some, uh, randomly selected taxis with surprise request prediction and route map. So um, this is the result. So each figure represents the taxi heat map. So many taxi are okay, grid, arbitrary. Each one bumper has one bumper grid. So uh, the figures, the top of uh, the, sorry, for each figure, the X, Y are different. X, Y, okay. Yes, uh, The horizontal, that represents each different text. Okay? And at time zero, everything is the same. So if you look at cross time, if we move towards the right, you see the bottom one, which is our technique, they actually even out a lot of these hot spots. Whereas the top uh, three, still when you get hot. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, this is what it means. Uh, basically, we get 40% more stenting coverage quality improvement maximum with a budget of $4,000, <coughs> which is pretty good if you consider air pollution stenting in the city. Each sensor costs $10 million. $4,000, that's pretty good. And 40%. And also, to get the same amount of coverage improvement, we need one tenth of the cost. Okay. Okay. And so we actually work with the company um, because I only have seven PhD students, and the Chinese government has given the money. 
<laughs> so uh, we collaborate with a Chinese uh, company where they actually help uh, help deploy help us deploy nine different kinds of things. Um, so right now, right well, as of last night, we have 146 Shenzhen. As the day before, I have 147 Shenzhen. I don't know how to do that one part. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, right now we have also 19, uh, 19 cars in the And then I will try to show you this. Okay. I will try to show you this. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's risky to do a live demo. Okay. Work? Okay. It did. Okay. Stop. It's risky to do live demo and risky to use Windows on Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the general informational platform they help us build. Uh, basically, Lots of different uh, places. Uh, oh, sorry, lots of different information. You can see, oh, 19 now. 146, that part still missing. It actually went dry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you see, like, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of information. We have uh, seven air pollutant information. You can see that from the previous 24 hours. Uh, the city selection is up here. Uh, this is a nice little summary. But you can already see some interesting factors. Namely, this is a 24 hour graph, and the vertical is the pollution numbers. Uh, this is PM2.5, PM10. And you can see this time is actually in uh, China time. Right? So it's actually the daytime is in the real daytime. There's a little bug. During the daytime, the PM2.5 actually drops, and during the nighttime, it what is PM? Part? What is PM? Of oh, particular matter, 2.5. So, it's a really tiny particle that can go into our lung. 2.5 is the most uh, the baddest one. 10 is a little bigger, it only goes into the lung, so it only gives you lung cancer, a lot better. <laughs> um, <laughs> Recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, 10 is also bad because it, it gets bad enough the air, airplane. So, so in China, sometimes you get interesting things where it gets too cold and people turn on their cold uh, heaters and that creates a lot of pollution in the air so the airplane cannot land it's too cold. Um, interesting. Um, but you'll notice something interesting, which is uh, NO2, uh, PM10, those are due to the factories uh, not operating as much in the day. That's when we notice the pollution. Mm -hmm. um, and also, like uh, during the during the daytime, so the O3 goes up really big. I, 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 there's a couple papers recently this year about uh, how sunlight like O3. We don't have a true understanding about what this uh, chemical process is, but like sunlight is supposed to break down O3, but whenever the sun comes out, O3 is high. Uh, we believe there's some process that converts O3 and the NO2, so that's why you see the inverse. So we're already discovering some interesting things just from these figures, but we can also see some, we can also see um, we can also see something when we actually post this on a uh, map. And when the internet comes. Uh, so we do overlay the wind data. Ah, there we go. So this is the little city that we have, um, that we have most of the vehicles. So if uh, this is the finer grain information that's based on both the static, uh, static uh, sensor that we have and the, uh, and the mobile. So today is pretty good. Uh, it's usually pretty good when the wind is blowing from the ocean. Okay. 
And if we zoom out, that slowly goes, uh, it falls back into the uh, figure solution. Solutions. <coughs> zoom out, see the pollution over different countries. Uh, so, what kind of things can we get? Well, maybe we can look at what happened in August. So, August, I believe there was a typhoon on August 11th coming up. And you see the air pollution is great. The typhoon, I believe, is landing around this part. I don't know that's fine, but the typhoon is great for air. <laughs> so, so you see, it, the, the air is actually clearer than I've ever been around the around the east, which is uh, just nice. <laughs> However, the, the pressure you do see actually created a sort of a blockage kind of thing, where the uh, the western region actually uh, love that factor. It's, it's also quite interesting that uh, I was surprised with how bad. But uh, the visualization shows shows you that okay. now. Enough risky <laughs> my presentation. So what we have then is actually uh, both buses in the mobile case and the taxi. In the Shenzhen, it's mostly the electric taxis are typically good. They don't pollute. They don't pollute while they're driving around, so we can go. Um, but uh, you already see this platform. So I'm going to show you an example of trend analysis. It's forever to load. That's why I actually recorded this. But um, this is on day one. So this is uh, after a few days of clear, um, clear air. Right? So the factories are on the eastern, upper eastern side. So when the air wind is blowing toward the upper right, that's your pretty. Good. The next day, air got a little bad, and you see the air is starting to creep in on the upper upper floor. And there's some mountains on the left side, so it does attract mountains all the way up. Not a great fact. And then on day three, you see the wind actually died down a bit. You see the wind died down, so all the kind of building up here. Um, this is all you intended. And on day four, the wind direction changed again. So it's going toward the east, going out to sea, eventually hitting North Korea. Not a problem. <laughs> 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 Sometimes the wind do shift south a little bit uh, and hit South Korea. And the news just reported, so it's uh, not a very difficult political thing, but uh, a little sensitive, which I really shouldn't have today. <laughs> <laughs> but on the data itself, we actually look at the data. So this is data of PM uh, 2.5 on July 28th. So I believe it's Shenzhen when it first deployed, actually. The vertical is a PM concentration. Horizontal is the time over, over, over half a month. OK. And you see this very strange periodic peak. This is a fixed stage, so we actually know the location. Okay. So why the peak? It made no sense. If our sensor broken, we went out and we put a chair there, sat there, and watched for a day. And then around noon time, this barbecue went to start itself. So, so you see the challenge of actually controlling air pollution, right? Without a fine grain understanding of what the pollution is, there's all these temporary polluting uh, polluting sources that we have no control. Um, in report. Uh, so, I'm trying to think of a way to say it. Um, so there are. So one one of the problems is the, the pollution monitor to go home by the clock. Right? That's that's a mandated by law, eight to five, right? Factory um, owners in private aren't controlled by such a mandate. So they could certainly turn 
down the nerve filter and hide. I'm not saying anyone does this. <laughs> just saying, it would be nice to know that doesn't happen. Um, which is why the government is very interested in these kinds of things. Okay. So I think I um, wasted enough of enlightening enough today. Uh, basically, we have shown the affluation system that you can two prediction boxes. And we have evaluated this on um, test bed with real history data and out in the real environment. And I always say, as a faculty, my biggest strength is taking credit from my students. <laughs> uh, so this is actually work from Xin Lei, Su Su, and Xin Yu out in Tsinghua. Uh, uh, Xin Lei from ECE, Su Su from uh, CE, and also faculty Carly uh, from ECE, Chai Yong from DE, and then, and with that, Like those peaks as outliers, or just outliers? I mean, outliers. Yeah. Uh, so, so yes, you could. So to see a general trend, in fact, we do smooth the data a lot, right? Uh, but the peak also have good information because that peak did actually pointed out an unlicensed treatment, um, which is which is a problem perhaps. Um, so. so um, so those things we do want to keep in some type of analysis, but in general trend analysis, the right yes, The discussion comes from other countries. Other countries. Uh, so particular reason in Tianjin that I showed you is uh, surrounded by North Korea, which does not have much pollutants. They don't lose much. Yeah. <laughs> um, or but they're a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, and South Korea, which has uh, got much tighter regulation, so the only source is coming from China. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yes. <laughs> However, um, in the Western region, uh, I think uh, the majority of the source is coming from the, the region itself. But there will also be something that come across the mountain, get trapped by the mountain. So that could. If we do it in the micro, uh, the micro fountain, um, there are sources that both known, known factories that are allowed, and the unknown sources, namely the fact that turn out the scrubbers, any uh, street vendor. And I think those come a lot too. So is it possible for us to compare the data from those who did different data to understand how much pollutants come from the unfriended companies? Oh yeah. Uh, well, no, because the, the government wouldn't share with us what the which, company, which, company which companies are allowed. Okay, okay that's, are, that's a politically more sensitive. Like, uh, but uh, they, you could find the pollutant source, right? Because if you have a pollution map, have the wind data, could backpack this to where the So I think that's that like, that that's like backtracking how the pollution is Yeah, but we actually do have very good detailed information. So it's, yes, it's a very hard problem, but uh, if, you have the, if you have your cards surrounding the pollution source, you can. So this actually brings to an interesting problem. Here, all the things I'm presenting you is assuming that what we want is an evenly true. But that's not the case, is it? Right? Because if there's a gluten source, we want more information from there. We actually want higher density. Right? So we, all we have to do in this case is we just change the utility function. You still um, But basically, you change that, you actually change your. Uh, so the utility function is what utility is to us. 
So the utility to the sense. So basically, once we define what better merging, what better data to us, then we can find it. Um, can you
optimal strategy would be to use a combination of both the lower cost pollution sensor along with this. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, the, the graph you see, the zoom out one is actually purely based on the uh, fixed sensor. Right? Those, because at that resolution, you know, 10 in one city is already perfect. Now, the only time when you actually need this is per city, particularly where a lot of people live, where a lot of health is on the line. Uh, that's when you So only when you zoom in, uh, those figures, that, that's where the tax is. And that's also where particular tree vendor will actually cause a lot of problems. That's why one of the high costs. This is a follow on to that question. How are you, or not or how, but um, how far are you going to scale? Do you want to be within multiple major cities? Like in other places? Well, we're, we're not limited to China. Right? So if you actually look at, uh, you know, we all hear about how good the Beijing is. Uh, Beijing, I believe, is uh, even as first time, which was like three years ago, was sixty most polluters. I mean, there are fifty some cities that were polluting more worse than that. And in some days, Salt Lake City is worse than Beijing. And so there's uh, certainly a lot of uh, a lot of places where this. Now we're only doing Beijing because you know, uh, but once this uh, gets more mature, I think uh, it's going everywhere. Is the hope, right? So people understand. One is so that the government can understand and react to what's what's uh, the pollution source, are. and the people can understand and react what their impact is on um, their own daily activity on um, the pollution just around. So if you don't know, don't care. But if you do know, like uh, vacuum and create a lot of pollution, maybe I'll act in the open. The floor, well, not the forest, right? So, real behavior change comes from. Um, so, the place that was black, were they along the actual roads or just on the job? I'm sorry. The grades that were marked for understanding uh, the coverage uh, were they along the actual roads or just along the job? They are not on the actual uh, So, the the grids are actually uh, just GPS grids that are record. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, for the data I showed you, Beijing is on the grid system, and New York is also on the grid system. So it actually works out kind of well. But uh, in some other cases, I could imagine, yeah, the grid. So, so in, in that case, if the system is not grid, actually the road, road system is not grid, so in that case, does the model consider that they are actually involved woods in a particular detail because we're talking about the distribution? Uh, yes. Uh, so taxis are also not allowed for it. So we have a big empty block in the middle. Right? So even when it's a grid, there are places where there are no inside. And the system keeps on telling us to go into the <laughs> so, so yes, there is a problem there. We have to actually plan to block it out. Uh, then the city just tell you to start around. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it is a problem. Uh, every city will have, not every, many places will have places to uh, go into. Right? Area 51. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, so, so I would imagine, yes, there will be empty block and manual. Oh, map actually does. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, don't be scared. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you use it? Um, we treat the information. We actually the the information from low cost sensors are really bad. Um, not because the sensor itself is inaccurate. But because the car drive around, the wind and everything just makes the sensors crazy. And it kicked up dust, so it's all. Um, but the pollution sensors that are fixed are also. Um, why? Because the pollution sensors are built by the Chinese government. <laughs> <laughs> the sensors are currently deployed 
are placed in places where it's out of the way. Uh -huh. uh, which tend to be in the middle of the <laughs> Uh, except the sensors from the uh, the sensor placed by the, the at the U.S. Embassy, which is placed in a particularly bad way, that shows more pollution. Mm -hmm. right, so, so you see, this <laughs> be, there are some there are some things that people are doing. I, I don't want to record, uh, but uh, so so I, we actually treat the we do treat the big sensors as the ground truth, but maybe we should. How do we feel that uh, we have uh, we have a certainty measure where we actually place the certainty of the particular uh, station as one? Why one? Very certain. Uh, and the cars that are rounded as the certainty metric itself. We run find kind of a off the mic. Um, so when the two cars run into each other, then they actually, based on the value of how long they have met, they, they have another map, and then they can exchange information. So basically, the information is slowly carried by the car further. So we have a paper. There's a paper that we want. What's the range of data for each individual taxi that you're talking about? So, what is the what? What's the range of data that every sensor on a taxi has? So, how much of a grid are you covering? So, is it like a kilometer, two kilometers? How much? So, you... for each time frame, which we actually set a time frame to be about five minutes, so basically the taxi can get to the next grid okay. when when the traffic is good, which is almost never. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, one grid is our assumption. Uh, now, we have seen taxis in our Shenzhen deployment where they actually cover like 20 grid lines when they're on the phone. And basically, also, those parts we have particularly good coverage. And so, so that kind of gives you an idea. Basically, it's based on the vehicle. Okay. Um, the faster the speed, though, we have less data yeah. per grid as well. So, but we do treat the data as interval. Driving by that data belongs to that grid. Yeah. Great. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, we'll probably end there. It's close to one anyway. Um, please give another round of applause. To I think you should go into comedy. And, and <laughs> I, I like it. <laughs> uh, so feel, feel free to come up and ask individual questions. Uh, look, look closely at those equations. That you can do. Again, this happens every two weeks. Um, make sure that you sign in so that we can send you that information uh, for our upcoming talk. So thank you for coming. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's Yeah. Oh, you see the Right, yeah.